All right, I think we are live. Ryan and Yamini, thanks for joining us. Uh, maybe just quickly introduce yourselves and then I'll, uh, I'll jump in with some really hard hitting questions. Yamini, why don't you start? Ryan. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Ryan Dennehy, founder and CEO of Electric. Uh, we sell managed uh, IT support to SMB and middle market customers as a subscription SaaS product. Uh, we're four years old, about 250 employees. We're doing do just around 17 million ARR this year. Um, and uh, prior to this, I had a company uh, that was acquired by Groupon. Uh, so very familiar with uh, all things SMB. That's great. Uh, this is uh, Yamini joining from somewhere in California, uh, which is which is great. Um, I am the chief customer officer at HubSpot, and HubSpot actually is the uh, customer relationship management platform for small and medium businesses. We are based out of Cambridge, but operate in across the globe, uh, about 900 million in revenue. And before coming to HubSpot, which I joined earlier this year, I was at Dropbox, another company that was kind of serving the small and medium businesses. And before that, I spent about 15 years across uh, Siebel, SAP, and Workday, all in the enterprise. So kind of have a combination of enterprise and SMB. Um, pleasure to join you, and thanks for having me, Jeff. Awesome, thanks for being here. So let me let me just start with, um, and, and we have a mix of folks tuned in from frankly all over the world. Um, what, what, if you guys were to describe, when you think about go-to-market for an SMB tech business, What's the unique, you know, what are the unique elements of go-to-market that you have to think about? And I know this is like a multi-hour conversation because there's sales and marketing and onboarding and customer success and everything else. But like, you know, people always talk about how investors who focus on large enterprise don't get SMB. And one of the reasons why we've spent the last few years really focusing on this category is so that we did get it and we could bring lessons learned and ideas and best practices. Can you guys share some of the things that you've learned over the years? And maybe, Yamini, let me start with you because you've done this you know, at scale at Dropbox, you're doing it at scale at, at HubSpot. And then Ryan, you know, I want to maybe get the other side of the perspective as you build an SMB tech business. How do you, you know, how do you get the organization to understand the unique components of go to market with respect to to, uh, to SMB? So Yamini, maybe start with you. Yeah, you know, uh, it's fundamentally different. And, uh, you know, I'd say that coming out of like SAP and Workday and first starting at uh, Dropbox, understanding the SMB business, you know, I look at it mostly from a customer perspective. So if you look at it from a customer perspective, the overall buying process is completely different. In SMB, it's all about immediate value. You know, they don't have a ton of time. They don't have a ton of resources. They want to maximize immediate return on value. And so their, you know, overall buying process is completely different. It's just very quick. It's about the next, you know, return that they can get. The decision making process is completely different. It's typically one person within the SMB organization mm -hmm. makes the decision. Um, even for a CRM platform, it's maybe the owner, the sole proprietor, or maybe the first employee or the 10th employee, but there it's typically not decision by committee, whereas it is a lot of decision by committee from an enterprise perspective. And I, I think, uh, you know, it's also like how uh, SMBs get influenced and where they look for information. It's very, very different. In SMBs, it's about peers. It's about looking at other companies. It's actually going to places of peer reviews like G2 Crowd, where they understand what's happening, three or four questions, a couple of trials, and then they make the purchase decision. Enterprise, it's a, it's a lot of different influencers and certainly not as much on the peer sides. I could go on and on, but yeah. I will tell you that the fundamental difference that I found is that when you're serving uh, the SMB market, you have to use both a combination of qualitative inputs as well as quantitative inputs to be able to understand who you're serving, how they like to purchase, and what their decision-making process is. But know that the playbook is completely, you know, different when you think about. It. And the, sure the, the word of mouth that. thing is such a the word of mouth thing is such a powerful concept. And I know Ryan, you guys have experimented with community. Mm -hmm. uh, in the customers that you're serving. Can you maybe touch on that when, as you get back to the original question? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I would say first and foremost, I mean, community, community is definitely part of it, but I think the thing that catches a lot of people off guard initially about selling into the SMB segment is that it's really a numbers game. It's about, it's about science, it's about data, it's about repeatability, it's about all these things. And so, you know, my, my first startup, 
you know, 12 some odd years ago, you know, it was an ad business. And so it was really easy for my co-founder and I to go out and meet with agencies one-on-one -on -one and get to our first, you know, call it $5 million in revenue without a sales team, right? If you're in the SMB space and you're, and, and you're a founder, and you're just starting out, you're not going to get to 5 million in revenue. You're probably not even going to get to 2 million in revenue if it's founder led sales, right? Um, <laughs> it's just not, it's just not going to work. Right. And so I think that's the thing that really catches people off guard. So, you know, if, if you're out there and you're saying, I've got this really good idea, I've got a problem that I think is really important for me to solve for, for, for SMBs, you really have to bake in real resources going into your go to market motion. The second that you've got that product market fit, because, it's never going to work if you're just trying to sell a little bit of the time and do product and do all this other stuff. I mean, I know that at Electric, for example, you know, within six months of launch, we were already hiring and ramping our first AEs because that yeah. was the only way that it's going to work past your first, you know, dozen or so reference customers. And I think that just that constantly catches people off guard when they're first starting out. And then, Ryan, one of the things I know you guys have spent a lot of time on is understanding who your target customer is. And it's something I think is, is challenging at any level, whether you're a large company or a small company or going after enterprise or SMB. But in SMB, it's particularly important because if you get it wrong, it, it creates high churn. Can you just talk about how you guys spent time figuring out who the right target customer was and sort of where you are in that journey? Well, the problem is it changes over time. Right? <laughs> Some, someone who is a great customer, you know, someone who is a great customer of electric in 2017, um, you know, our opinions have changed over time, right? Our average deal size is four times what it was three years ago. And so some of that is endemic to any young company where, you know, while we had immediate product market fit, it was, it was, it was broad. And so um, just speaking from the perspective of, of an earlier stage company, um, as you, as the product matures and as you get more data, you're going to learn some things and you're going to say, Hey, you know what? The person we thought that was a great customer a couple of years ago, actually what we're finding is our sweet spot is this. And so you have to have the discipline to then sit down and do the hard work of clearly defining what that bullseye looks like. You know, who's right in the middle, who's one step out, who's two steps out, and then draw the line and say, if you're, if you're, if you're this far out, we're just not going to sign you up. And then for any customer that falls there now, um, maybe we're going to choose not to renew. We're going to work with them to find uh, a partner who's a better fit. But, um, in, you know, in my understanding, uh, Yamini, I'd love to hear your take on this, is that uh, that process never stops, no matter how big it is. <laughs> exactly. 100% right. And I, I tell you that the um, segmentation strategy is almost foundational to anything that you do that involves like product market fit, um, pricing strategy, positioning strategy, marketing strategy, for any of that, you know, we have to start with segmentation strategy. So I really spend a lot of time thinking about the segments and then the personas within the segments that we actually serve. And to Ryan's point, it actually transforms. So for HubSpot, we take our, you know, um, SMB focus, we serve companies with one to 2000 employees, and then we sub segment each of those. And we look at it as, you know, kind of retail, you know, one to 10 employees, small business, you know, 11 to 25, mid-market up to, you know, 200 and then corporate, which is like 200 to 2000. And that's kind of the segmentation. It's important to look at almost all the data that you have and look at it in terms of the segments. Then we look at like buying patterns. How do these, you know, customers and how do personas within each of those segments actually go through the process of buying? You know, are they tilting towards e-commerce? Do they feel comfortable going to the website and giving their credit card and buying? Do they actually want to talk to a sales rep? And how do we make that determination? So we really follow both quantitatively as well as qualitatively the personas and how they actually go through that process within each segment. And then we tailor, you know, everything that we do from a go-to-market perspective, from marketing, from sales, as well as customer success, so that we are meeting the needs of that buyer within the segment and absolutely changes like what the you know marketing mary persona that we actually served in 2010 has become way more sophisticated once you know a lot more right now and has become kind of the sophisticated michelle and so yes that persona changes and we have to keep track of who that persona is but it's so critical yeah. to you know how we grow on scale and i think folks have learned along the way i you know we have a 
legendary story internally about not investing in an SMB tech business that's now worth $25 billion today. Because when it was private, the churn rate was really high. It was, it was over 40%. And what we missed, this was over a decade ago, but what we missed was that they were in the process of iterating and figuring that out. And, and to your point, Ryan, it is iterative. And I think early on, it's hard when investors look at SMB tech businesses because they do see high churn and they don't sort of understand that there's a journey there to figure that out. Uh, and, and you've got companies, you know, Brent was on this morning from Big Commerce talking about how they started out in the, in the small end of the SMB space and have migrated towards mid-market. They're still serving both, but it's, but it's been a journey. What about, uh, and I guess on that, one of the things that um, is maybe hard for the outside world to understand is how complicated it is to onboard these customers, right? Because they're not, you know, if you sell to a large enterprise, you'll work day to a large enterprise, there's a consulting firm, you know, a six to 12 month onboarding process, there's integration, there's, that doesn't happen in the SMB space. So can you guys talk a little bit about the go to market part of this that is onboarding and then driving success for those customers when you know, they may not be paying you enough every month to make it a super high touch experience. It goes back to the, this, this, this notion of process and automation. I mean, everything has to be, has to be hyper efficient. I mean, and then it, all the departments have to talk to each other in a way where maybe at, at an enterprise company, um, it's important, but you know, you can't just like throw something over the wall to professional services and hope they figure it out. There's no systems integrator that you can sort of uh, lean, lean on. Blame. And run up a bunch blame of. when things go wrong. Blame the SI. I mean, right? Yeah. And you just don't have that in, in in the SMB space. And so, like you know, one thing we talk a lot about is like like great onboarding starts actually in the sales discovery, right? So you know, our average deal size is about forty thousand dollars annually. Um, so our customers are expecting a lot, but you know, in order for our onboarding team to be successful, they have to know what they're walking into. And so a really tight partnership between our head of sales and head of customer success and, and constantly looking at the data and saying, are we learning enough before the customer even comes in so we can make them successful? Um, you know, we've also, we've spent a lot of money building software to help automate some of the touchier points of the onboarding, one, to make it more efficient for us, but two, the, the second that we get human hands off of it, the more likely we can do it um, predictably and successfully and accurately uh, at scale. So um, again, I, I think it's probably, Yamini, what, what you guys do is, is that, but just on a much more sophisticated scale. Um, but at 900 million in ARR, I mean, what, I'd love to know what HubSpot's doing. Yeah, you know, uh, I think one of the most fundamental shifts that have happened with cloud is that retention is almost more important than acquisition. You know, the repeat revenue is like more important than revenue. Um, and I think that's why onboarding and handoff to customer success is really the point of focus in terms of our overall customer experience. And uh, I, the way we think about it is, again, going back to segmentation. You know, what becomes jarring is that if a customer you know, signs up through the website and we then send them through a person for onboarding and then we ask them to go to a knowledge base for customer support, we're basically not actually helping them find the right answer. So the focus for us has been based on the segments that we serve, what is a product led customer experience versus what is a person led customer experience. And we begin to really hone in on each of those customer experiences and making it really good. So from an onboarding perspective, similar to what you just said, Ryan, we start thinking about the product led onboarding. What are the things, you know, a checklist that we can provide to really get that initial activation period? And then beyond that activation period, what are the things that we can do to keep engagement? So the metrics that we look at is, you know, activation, you know, engagement, usage, and then continued kind of value expansion. And each of those have plays and we can talk about that, but I think that's the way we approach it. It comes back to segmenting and making sure that the experience the customers get through onboarding um, really delivers the kind of value that they need in that particular segment. And you said something earlier, Yamini, that I thought was interesting. You said that you said recurring revenue is more important than revenue. <laughs> Can you just repeat revenue? Repeat revenue. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you just touch on that? Repeat revenue is way more important yeah. than revenue. So <laughs> can you just touch on that and what you meant by that? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, uh, I'd say like for you know the first decade of my career, you know, I spent a lot of time with you know in sales and Siebel and 
SAP and was always about winning the customer. And I think what has fundamentally shifted is that if you think about the old funnel and you, you know, start with leads and you win a customer and you're like, yeah, celebrate the customer. Well, actually, that doesn't do any good because if you win a customer, but you have a leaky bucket and you keep losing customers, especially mm -hmm. in the SMB portion of the segment that we're talking about, and there's a leaky bucket, then you cannot fill that funnel fast enough for you to have a healthy, growing, thriving, scaling business. And so what is really critical is making sure that you finish that funnel. We call it the flywheel and you convert your customers into delightful you know, uh, promoters of your software and your technology. And in order to be able to do that, and that's the, that's the point where they become a repeat customer and it's repeat revenue. And so you know, as much as the focus was in winning the customer before, now the focus is really on delighting the customer and ensuring that they repeat customers. And I'll tell you like the single metric that I care about in a SaaS you know, uh, SMB company or any, you know, size company is revenue retention. And revenue retention is, you know, overall net ARR, you know, plus upgrades, minus downgrades, minus churn. And if, if, you're, if you're doing delightful customer experiences and if you're delivering that to your customer, they're going to stay and then they're going to vote with their wallet and therefore the retention actually increases, which is why I care a lot more about repeat revenue than just revenue. Yeah. And and one of the hardest things historically has been to find team members that understood these concepts, because if you think about the SMB tech space, it's really kind of exploded post 2010, you know, post post sort of iPhone and AWS and FinTech. Prior to that, it was really into it. Right. And then, but then we had Square and Zendesk and HubSpot and a bunch of other companies. And so more recently, we are finding our companies are able to go out in the market and recruit people who have experience in the SMB space. But can you guys just talk a little bit about team building and growth and how you've how you think about that how you focused on it and and what is are my comments even accurate was it harder five years ago than it is today to find people that understand the mechanics of these businesses yeah i mean i think at least from the perspective of of you know a, a, a smaller company now more than ever you've got to get these people you've got to get people with with experience in this segment uh, on board as, as as soon as possible and I think one of the biggest challenges, and this is not unique to the, the you know customer success side of the house, but just young growing startups in general is really thinking through what the plan looks like 12, 18, 24 months out and really calibrating the hires to, to that stage of the company's growth. Because, I mean, even in the early days of electric, we kind of fell victim to this in certain departments of saying, hey, here's my business today. I need to find somebody who can go do this. But by the time you actually recruit, ramp them, um, you know, the, the, the person comes in, they're already over their skis. And so uh, that's 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 super challenging. The, the, the second thing um, is I think that there's just there's a whole new there's a whole new talent pool of folks from this kind of first wave of SMB companies um, that I think at least for for a company, you know, us were a series B company going to series C. Uh, there's a lot more. Uh, there's a lot more companies that you can hire from where people are going to be coming in with with the, with the pedigree. Um, you know, we've hired several people from Yext, uh, probably to at the behest of Yext, uh, <laughs> including our chief customer officer. But uh, you know, in every yeah. city that you're in, there's probably a handful of publicly traded examples of companies that have really, you know, nailed their their product in the SMB space, and those are good places to look. Yeah, I, I think Jeff. You know, yes, things have been much more kind of. You know, difficult in terms of getting the right kind of talent who understand the business at a broader lens. I mean, if you go back, you know, 10 years, 15 years, you could just hire phenomenal salespeople. We can hire phenomenal marketing people. We can, you know, hire some good like support people, right? But the whole world of customer success is different. And I think what we need now uh, in the SMB space, but also everywhere in SaaS, is people who think customer in not function out you know mm -hmm. if i go to a sales leader and i say what is your strategy i don't want our sales leader you know to come back and say hey my strategy is like growing sales and hitting this number i want them to say that it is about that entire customer experience and so one of the bigger changes that we have seen in terms of bringing onboarding new leaders and helping them grow um so that they can help us grow better is actually giving them a much more holistic perspective of the business 
we get like all sales leaders to think about not new ARR, but net new ARR, mm -hmm. which is again, including the churn and the downside. And it's actually bright lights. They were like, wow, this is great. Like now I can begin to see that, yes, I'm adding so many reps and they're producing so much, but at the same time, 12 months after, this is how much we re retain. So that is the change that's happening. That's the kind of leaders that are now in the market that are thinking customer in, not just function out. Um, and it's it's great. It's great to see a lot of those leaders developing. Yeah, if you go back pre SaaS, you know, sort of pre 2010, when the world was mostly enterprise license, which sounds like, you yeah. know, forever ago, it was support because you sold somebody software and they basically owned it. They owned it for, That's you know, right. and so it's a very different mentality when the success of your company depends literally every day on the on that relationship with that customer. And I think that's just been a huge mindset shift over the last five to seven years. Um, how about um, talk a little bit about uh, what you guys are seeing uh, in the customer base, you know, health of the SMB economy, any data points that you can share with us, uh, anecdotes, you know, maybe contrasting Q2 with Q3. Just love to hear any commentary that you guys have because you do have your finger on the pulse of of what is happening out there with customers that are buying tech in the in the SMB space. And Yamini, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, uh, a lot has happened this year. I mean, Jeff, like not a surprise. This year has been very tumultuous and all up and down. And SMBs, I mean, you know, I think when we all kind of, uh, when COVID hit and we all were like, oh my God, there's so much uncertainty. What is actually going to happen? We all assume that SMBs are going to be completely obliterated. Now, I think what we have found is that certain sectors um, like travel, like entertainment, like hospitality have been impacted you know, pretty significantly, but then there are a whole bunch of other sectors that have found their way. They've been resilient enough to kind of like shift their entire operations, their go-to-market, their entire customer experience online. Mm -hmm. And so um, what we started doing in April is we started benchmarking all of our customers. So we have 85,000 customers and we've started like benchmarking all of our customers and saying, what's happening in terms of the top of the funnel? What's happening in terms of the deal? Q2, you know, as we all know, we hit some uncertain spots and we found that you know, QL volumes were down and deal creation was down. Therefore, the total MRR created was down. And so we saw all of those trends. But I do think that to my you know, earlier point, for most of the sectors that were not directly impacted by COVID, we've seen you know, all of those metrics you know, climb back up in terms of QL volumes, in terms of deals closed, in terms of MRR and ARR closed. They've all kind of got back up. And I do think there is a tailwind in terms of uh, the digital shift. There is, you know, a lot of like now companies in SMB, they know that they need to operate in a hybrid world. You know, today the economy, today New York might be open and some other country might close or some other, you know, part of the country might actually close. And so they're all been very smart in terms of getting ready for a very hybrid world and uh, also very smart to be prepared for uncertainty for a little while. And so I do see a lot of the benchmarks and the trends kind of pointing in the right direction. And it shows the resilience that, you know, the mm -hmm. SMBs actually have, and they've been able to kind of operate in, in very uncertain terms. So it's it's a little bit of a positive, you know, tailwind from our perspective. Yeah. How about you, Ryan? Same, same exact thing. But this actually goes back to the point where like the nuance around segmentation is so important in SMB, in addition to, to, to verticals, right? Obviously, Verticals like, you know, hospitality and travel were, were, were deeply impacted. But, you know, for example, at, at Electric, you know, our, our target customer is somewhere in the, you know, 20 full-time employees to like 250, 300 full-time employees. We have some who are larger and some who are smaller, but that's kind of, you know, what we found is and these are mostly businesses that are working in offices. And so we found that, that because we're not talking about the two-person company or the five-person company, most of our customers had a far more robust business um, than one would typically ascribe to the SMB segment. Um, and so as a result, you know, churn and down sales uh, in Q2 and early part of Q3 were, were lower than, you know, some of the sort of doomsday plans that we had put together, you know, much lower, uh, which was great to see. And then, you know, sales rebounded pretty substantially. I mean, Q3 was, was, was our, our biggest quarter ever. Um, you know, if I, if I plotted the graph of our, uh, you know, marketing sourced bookings, which Jeff, I know you, 
you were a fan of Nike the recovery. And I think the recovery is going to look like yeah. a Nike swoosh, right? And so, you know, March it was here, April it was here, but you know, if I if I look at it now, we're we're already back up. Um, and so I think that just shows the resiliency of uh, of small businesses in America. So yeah, I'm I'm definitely I'm definitely long SMBs, and and we have the data to back it up. Yeah, we're going to share some data this afternoon. We did a survey of several thousand SMBs, and the data would suggest that while Q2 was extremely challenging, the the SMB economy is doing better than people think. And yeah. I think part of that is cut, uh, SMBs were investing in technology a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, not with the idea that there was a pandemic coming, but just that that was the right thing to do. And then, uh, you know, there are certain categories that are booming. Uh, you know, try to buy a bike, try to buy a used car, try to buy, try to get anything done on your home. Uh, and so while travel and hospitality have been decimated and restaurants really challenged, there are these other pocket uh, categories that are that are booming. So, well, thank you, guys. I uh, appreciate the time. Uh, we're, we're out of time. But Yamini and Ryan, this was awesome. I know lots of great thoughts for people to take away and appreciate you guys making the time. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jeff. Absolutely.